Aman, you are currently 23 years old. You have represented Canada in the World Chess Youth Olympics multiple times. Um, I believe you became a FIDE Master in 2009 and International Master in 2013. That's right. uh, you are part of Chess Pro Stream and you have been coaching chess for a number of years as well. Is that all correct? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so how did you originally get into chess? Um, well, I can tell you I was pretty young myself. I was you know, four or five years old and it's uh, how it all usually starts. Dad gave me a chess board when I was five years old. It doesn't really run in the family, but he just gave me the baby steps. And you know, after beating him a year later, I just ran with it myself. So, was there something at that time about the game that like really appealed to you? I'm not sure. You know, those are pretty early years, like kind of uh, foggy memories, to be honest. But uh, I think it appealed to me just from a strategic point of view that you know something very small that, you know, a little kid like me could actually outsmart my dad in. And that, that actually kind of appealed to me. So I'm pretty sure that's what actually got me hooked on it. And I think for like anyone who doesn't know a whole lot about chess and they see these like young kids playing against adults and a lot of the cases crushing them, yeah. it, it doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> it's the way it is, it's so cool. Yes, no, it's not uncommon to see, you know, a kid who doesn't even need a chair to play the game uh, against, uh, you know, full-grown adults actually being the favorite nowadays. So, I look from my side where I really enjoy playing the game and obviously I want to get as skilled as possible, um, and you really do get to play for a living. Is it a dream job for you? Um, I, would, uh, I would say that's a pretty good description of it. Um, there's definitely things that happen in, in this you know, industry, I guess I could say, that you know, it's not all that it's hyped up to be. It's a lot of uh, solitary work. It's a lot of traveling. Um, you know, it's tough to say that it's for everybody, but for for me right now, at this point in my life, it's exactly what I want to be doing. So, do you think when people see this dream, they may think it's all just fun and you know, thirty second minute games of bullet chess? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot more than that. I think so. Like, it's, especially if you just look at the the stream, we do have a lot of fun, and you know, we are educational, but it is primarily like. Uh, it is an entertainment stream, so we do have a lot of fun there, a lot more probably than, than behind the scenes. Do you mind just talking a little bit about like what you guys do on the stream in case anyone you know, isn't familiar with it? Sure, yeah, well it's, um, it's on Twitch, twitch.tv slash chessbra, and uh, like I said, it's, it's obviously educational and we do want to improve the, the audience, uh, give them tips and tricks and advice and stuff like that. Um, in chess, but it is an uh, entertainment stream, so myself, uh, Eric Hansen, um, we just put on a show for people, play very fast uh, chess games, they're over very quickly, so it's very entertaining for people to watch, and there's an uncensored commentary, a lot of swearing, high energy music, and we just create the, that fun, like, Friday night atmosphere type of environment that people like to, to watch us do, do well and even watch us fail. So it's entertaining either way. And one of the things I have to admit that I really like about you know your videos in the stream is that you guys are so humble about it. Um, like you'll join an online tournament, you win every single game you play, and instead of you know talking badly about your opponents, you just say, "Oh, I could have played a little bit better at the end." Is that something you find a lot in chess, where players are just really humble? Yeah, it's chess has always been like the gentleman's sport. That that's what it's called. You know, you shake hands before every game and after every game, even if you don't like like the guy you're playing. Um, so it just always has that reputation and there's trash talking, but it's it's not that common and obviously I, I do trash talk certain players and I feel pretty amped up or good about a specific win, but I think in general being hypercritical of yourself is, is the way to improve. If I finish 10 out of 10, I probably am not happy with some of the games that I played, so I think just being critical uh, of yourself endlessly is, is how to improve. I have to admit, the first time that I realized how humble a lot of chess players are, um, I was just learning. Like, I was 1100 and I'm still learning now. Okay. Uh, there was a local event at like a library and someone told me to go to, so I did. And I went online and found like the coolest gambits I could find. And I was like, I'm going to play him and crush everybody. Uh -huh. uh, and I found a Danish gambit, so pretty dang aggressive. Uh -huh. uh, and this guy sits down and was like, hey, you know, do you want to play? I'm like, sure. And he had a, um, a club jacket on, so obviously I could tell he was probably pretty good. Yeah. So I opened with a Danish, obviously playing with white. And he, you know, just dismantled me game after game. And it, it wasn't like aggressively rude, and he was polite as can be. Sure. Um, so he told me to come to the club, you know, one of these weeks and, you know, sign up and come have some fun, which I've, I've done. Um, 
But after I left, I looked up the club, and the guy was a national master, like 2,300, okay. um, Connecticut state champ, a number of years. Didn't say a word about any of it. Yeah. Just told me good games and he was done. I was like, wow. Yeah. I almost took that away more than how good he was. Exactly. No, I, and that's pretty common. You know, a lot of, a lot of GMs, for example, you know, grandmasters are, they don't even mention who they are, and uh, often they're, they're totally, like, just a normal person until somehow it gets brought up, but they almost never do it themselves unless they need to. So how many hours do you find yourself playing or practicing a day in, in different ways? Um, I guess that depends on, you know, if I have an important tournament coming up, um, it'll be a lot more than usual. Um, if I'm, you know, streaming a lot or recording videos and stuff, it might be more than usual. Um, but it's nice that it's flexible. It's not like a full-time job where you have to do a certain amount every day. Uh, you know, there's definitely recommended doses, but I could do like 13 hours one day and then like four hours the next day, where sometimes I won't even you know, have a chance to touch it between uh, certain appointments and errands and stuff. But I would say like a good six to eight hours uh, in general, looking at it in some fashion, tactics, lessons, teaching kids, um, studying it myself, streaming, just playing online. In some form, I'm probably touching it you know, maybe 10 hours a day in total. So do you really like to vary it up? So, I mean, one big thing for me, I know when I play too long, I feel burnt out. Like, I, almost, I don't care if I win or I lose, I'm just moving pieces instead of what I call, you know, playing chess. Yeah. D do you ever feel that same way, especially doing it for a living? Uh, burnt out? I mean, in general, I can't, I can't agree, otherwise, yeah, I probably am in the wrong industry or something. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, we have our moments where we are just, just burned out. For me, it's usually just very brief, like, I'll be playing a lot online, suddenly I notice I'm starting to play very poorly, and I just need to take, you know, like a 10-15 minute break and then get back at it. Uh, just the monotonous, like, repetition of, you know, shoveling moves out, and, and you go on a bad streak, then you just need to take a step away. And a lot of people, uh, you know, are rage quitters. You know, they lose yeah. online and they just leave immediately. But that's actually like a very healthy way to reduce the amount of mistakes you make. Because if you keep playing through that rage, you might you might lose even more. And I've found that the more I've played and kind of more experience I've gotten, the more I can feel confident in telling myself like, I'll play more games. This loss isn't the end of the world. Is that something you've kind of? come to terms with too? Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, when you're starting out or, you know, in a specific moment, you might feel like this is, like, just terrible. I don't want to play the rest of these games. And, uh, you know, we've all, like, turned our back just, just from one loss, but uh, definitely comes come to terms with that. Um, that I, I've lost so many games it, to much weaker players. There's uh, guys out there who are, you know, half my rating, but might have that one win against me and that never played me again, so... I mean, it just, it happens, and, and we move on. Do you ever find that, like you're saying, like lesser players will make a bigger deal about it if they beat, you know, someone of your level? Yeah, sometimes sometimes it can be annoying, you know, they're, they're not necessarily trash talking, talking, but they're making a big deal over beating you, um, whereas in my situation, if I, uh, you know, would beat someone a lot better than me, I, I feel that I'd be quite humble, because I know that if I played them 10 more games, like, it, it would probably be maybe 10-0 for them. So I, I definitely take my, my wins with a, a grain of salt. And I think everyone should just because, you know, unless you're consistently beating a stronger player, you know, 15, 20 games, uh, then that really does show that you're playing above your level. But otherwise, you know, it might just be one lucky game. No, oh, definitely. So in all your years with the game, do you have any favorite memories that kind of stick out? Obviously, then, you know, even you know, doing the stream with Eric and whatnot, but in yeah. general, even tra traveling and whatnot? Well, it's, it's got to be something to do with traveling for me. Like, that's one of the, the biggest reasons that I, that I love this, this thing that I do, because um, if I was to pick a memory, it would probably be when I was, like, with Eric, traveling, um, and we went to Mexico, um, and that was the time when I got my first Grandmaster of Norm, and I only have one, so it's a pretty, pretty embedded memory for me. And probably my best chess that I played at that time. Um, I mean, it was first time in Mexico, so it's a super interesting trip from that perspective. And coupling it with playing my best chess ever, it was definitely probably the highlight for me in my uh, chess career so far. So you are going for Grandmaster, obviously. I am. Yeah, I haven't uh, haven't given up that uh, that dream yet. 
So quickly, is it, is it three norms and 2,500? Am I remembering correctly? That's right, yeah. yeah. So you, had, you said you had one norm then. Do, have you gotten another since? No, uh, that's what I was saying. I, I, I do only have the one, which is why that, that does stick with me uh, since so long ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I do have the rating, let's say the 2,500, but uh, it all comes down to, to making those norms. Um, any other places that you really like to travel for tournaments or whatnot? Yeah, well, I, I have quite a list. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we're definitely looking at the whole passport, you know, there's some interesting places. I'd say Iceland was very cool. Um, not literally. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually not, that, not that cold. I mean, it's chilly for sure, but you know, it's not living up to its, its name or anything like that. Um, very interesting place. Uh, Dubai, very interesting place. Um, but I, I really haven't been to Far East yet, and mm -hmm. that's that's where I, I'm most interested to go. So that's on the bucket list. So when you have traveled, have you been kind of welcomed by the chess community? I know you're saying like with it being a gentleman's game. Yeah. Uh, have you seen that kind of everywhere? Do you mean like the, the chess community in, in the places I'm traveling to? Yeah, whether it be kind of people approaching you um, that you don't know, saying like, hey, I recognize you, or I know what you do, or kind of being welcomed in different places. Um, yeah. I guess, have you been welcomed like a gentleman everywhere? More or less. I mean, there, there's definitely different places to play. Some places uh, don't care at all um, about chess. Um, <laughs> Canada is a pretty good example. Yeah. Um, that there's not really like a culture, but anywhere in Europe, um, if I was probably a grandmaster or a bit better player, I think I'd have more of that recognition. Um, but still, being from Canada, there, there's not too many Canadian players traveling the world playing chess, so that already gives me a bit of notoriety. Like, even if you don't care who I am, you might know who I am, just mm -hmm. because there's not that many Canadians doing it. Whereas places like Mexico, um, they're just chess fans in general. They, they don't really care how good you are. They, they wanted to take photos with me and stuff, and I, I wasn't yeah. even an international master then. I was a very weak player comparatively to, to now. So people stopping me on the streets and stuff, like it, it's a very, very different culture there. So I guess with that with community, in your time growing up, um, obviously internet chess has taken off and is probably going to continue to. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of the role that you see it having? The Well, the internet chess is, is taking over completely nowadays if someone is performing super well over the board, then if you look back, they, they've probably been online recently, you know, crushing everybody. Uh, that's a pretty common trend. Uh, it was true for me right before I made my Grandmaster norm, is that I was a pretty low-rated player playing well online and crushing a lot of people. Um, so that's gotten to be a pretty big trend. Everyone's practicing online, training online, anonymously or uh, publicly, and it's just gotten to be the, the best medium for training, study, practice, everything. And I know from my side, from, you know, the average player, when you can log on to chess.com and see Hikaru um, just, you know, <laughs> playing hundreds of games a bullet in a row. I know yes. Eric has been there, uh, you know, plenty of times. Absolutely. It's so entertaining. E even if I can't follow every single move, you know, in a middle game that's extremely complicated, yeah. there's definitely a beauty to it where, you know, it's dead even and there's stuff just flying around there. I mean, it's but that's true for me too. Like, mm -hmm. uh, when I log on and see Hikaru, you know, number three, top five player in the world playing online like that's that's a show for me too that, that doesn't change you know between being a beginner and, and being a, a strong player is that still seeing a top 10 player in the world just playing online for your amusement pretty much or his practice but both obviously is uh, it's just a treat um, even though I can't sometimes follow the positions it, it's awesome to watch them and if I remember correctly, you played Blood Online with him on uh, chess.com, is that right? I have, yeah. Uh, we've played on a, a few different interfaces, like there's a few different websites and, and platforms that people like to play and practice chess, it's not just one. So we've played on a, quite a few, but yeah, as you mentioned, I did play him on chess.com. Was it as intense as he thought it would be, you know, when you played him? Uh, well, it, it kind of, uh, there's like a starstruck effect, and like <laughs> I said, I, I've already played him on other platforms, so I was a bit more starstruck then. Um, so this time it's like I knew I had played him before, I know his style, I know where he's very strong and I even know some areas where I think he's possibly weak or, you know, that's, that's that one area I'm going for if I'm trying to beat him. Um, 
and I, I think I figured that stuff out from playing him in the past. So my most recent games with him, you know, not not too worried. There's obviously like pressure playing him, um, but it's it's not too bad. And I know that you would um put a video, I think, of you playing him somewhat recently on the Chess Breast yeah. uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, somewhat recent, maybe a couple months ago or so. And I know that uh, you pride yourself on your speed. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Because you looked like you were faster than him at the end, I have to admit. Yeah, like a, <laughs> a, a lot of people, um, you know, wonder how a guy like him can get so good. And um, he plays the middle of the game, the beginning, just super fast because he knows those moves in and out, like the back of his hand. And that's where guys like me are just inexperienced and not as good as him are going to take our time. But if I can stay even with him, you know, out of luck or he's making mistakes, then if it comes down to the end, then, you know, I, I'll take my speed over his. And it's interesting you say that because sometimes when I've watched you play, um, obviously you're extremely fast when you play Bullet, yeah. but if you're doing something like a Title Tuesday on Chess.com, you yeah. tend to play your opening a lot slower. Yeah, no, I, I'm known for that. It's, uh, it's a bad habit. <laughs> it's a bad habit. Um, you know, I, I, I'm fast, but I'm only fast when someone like smacks me in the face and says, hey, like, you have to be fast now. And yeah. I don't feel that pressure at the start of the game because it's like, oh, I know I have three minutes, I have five minutes. And, Whenever I have 20 seconds, I snap into it. Yeah, I, mean, I know anyone who's played uh, time has looked down at the clock and said like, oh, 15 seconds, better start moving a little faster. Yes, yeah, pretty common. And the same thing with um, Hikaru, what you said, I've noticed before, like Title Tuesday events, he, um, he'll be you know, out of the opening, up by a minute and a half. Yes. And they're like, well, it's gonna take a miracle for whoever it is to kind of get a better position here. Of course. So, with kind of the regular everyday perception of chess being kind of like a slower game, you know, for older gentlemen, yes. um, do you almost have like a scripted response that you tell people when they ask you if that's what chess is about? Um, no, I don't have a scripted one. I, I usually give, a, I guess, the same type of answer worded a bit differently every time whenever I get that asked that. And simply like a, I'm trying to embody and, you know, with Eric, that's kind of the whole point of Chess Bra Stream and why we started this thing is um, we don't want people to think that way about chess. We want to change the perception that, you know, it can be, a, it's obviously is a young person's game. and uh, We just don't want it to be thought of as, as nerdy or, or even something to be frowned upon socially. Um, and stereotypically it is, so we are trying to change that. Um, if you're in our stream, you'll probably notice that it's not like any other chess stream. Uh, out there right now, um, and and that's that's what we're trying to do with it. And one thing that's really cool about your stream is you don't need to really know a whole lot about chess to appreciate it. Not only in how fast it's going, but like even in the challenges you guys do. Like, what have been some of your favorite challenges? <laughs> yeah, like some of the challenges aren't even chess related. That's why they're so funny. Like, you know, do five push-ups after every move, um, or you know, play chess in a mirror. And then so like the mouse moves left, which is right, and down, which is up, and the whole thing is backwards. Oh my or God. play left-handed, or hold your breath for the entire game. Um, you know, we we've done pretty much anything under the sun, and it's hard. It'd be hard for people to come into our stream and suggest something, and we'll probably say, "Oh yeah, like we did that five months ago. Go check the YouTube." <laughs> do you um, do you feel comfortable doing the blindfolded games too? I've seen Eric yeah. do them unbelievably. Yeah, no, the blindfold is something I'm comfortable with. Uh, Eric a lot more so because he, he can, let's say, do multiple boards uh, or manage to do it really well in bullet, so uh, like with that really fast time control. Uh, I'm still capable of doing that, but you know, as the ratings of my opponents get a little bit better, the moves uh, become trickier, they play faster, that's where it's harder for me. But uh, I'm very, very capable of playing an entire game you know, without looking at the board. That's definitely something most strong chess players are, are capable of. And I've seen videos online of you know players doing blindfold. I know Carlson has a number of them on there. Um, but yeah. when you guys have done a few of your videos doing the blindfold, like you guys have a pre-move set. It's unreal. We have a witch. You must have like a pre-move as if you were like you call out the move even before yes. your opponent goes. Yeah. Well, because we obviously are good friends and we understand each other's chess a little bit. So you know if I'm seeing my opponent's or not my opponent, but if I'm seeing Eric's opponent move and I'm calling out his move, uh, I can already usually see the tactic that Eric's probably thinking in his head. And you know, there's about a split second delay between me hovering the move and, and him telling me to play it. So we do understand some of the same tactics and that's why 
uh, you'll often see us sort of be on the same page and in sync with that stuff. So with that, being really familiar with each other, do you guys like to practice together a lot? And kind of, yeah, probably, you know, probably uh, less so than, than people think, but because ch chess is kind of uh, really individual um, to a certain degree that, you know, despite us being good friends, we have, you know, completely different, if not opposite styles uh, to how we play. So uh, some things are very similar between us and some things are totally different. But yes, we, we do you know, study together, go over games, uh, just generally talk about chess, um, yeah, spar together, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, we have played each other uh, in real tournaments over the board. You know. Have you? Yeah, there, there's, no, there's no telling the organizer not to, to put two people against each other. So you know, it, it has to happen sometimes. And how recent was the last time that happened? Well, probably, um, probably the last time it happened in a serious tournament, which is not like going to be a rapid or a blitz, like a quick time control, um, might have been a few years now, um, and uh, the last couple have have all been ties uh, or draws. Um, Interesting. But we we have played each other in in like uh, quick time control, and uh, I think the last time we did it was rapid, and I think Eric won that one. Gotcha. I wouldn't have thought that. I, I wouldn't have thought that you guys would be playing each other like that. Obviously, it's, it's going to happen. But. Yeah. No, because, I mean, we are both Canadians. We play some of the same tournaments, travel together. Um, it does happen eventually. So, uh, roughly, how many um, tournaments do you play in a year now? Well, this year has been you know, a lot more stream-focused. And for me, like trying to get that GM, I need a, a bit more study. So for me, this year has been you know, pretty dry in terms of my schedule. Normally, it'd be a lot more. For example, in, in like 2013, um, I was playing maybe like two tournaments a month, one tournament a month, which is quite a lot. Like that, that adds up over the year. Um, but this year, maybe like one every three months type of thing, uh, one or two every three months. So a lot, a lot less for my standards. But I think in the summer, there's a lot more tournaments and then you know, in some of the winter months, it's pretty dry spell for, for playing. Um, so there's times of the year where you play a lot and times of the year where you kind of study and, and don't play as much. So do you ever find with a lot of the speed online chess, like does that ever take away from your kind of slow, longer games uh, over the board? Um, well, it's a good question. I think it's a pretty popular question that everyone would think that it does. Um, I don't think so though. Uh, when I play speed chess. Obviously, I'm trying to win. It's everyone's natural desire, but the, the number one thing I'm doing is training my ability to see things quickly, uh, tactics, stuff like that. So I am using it in a beneficial way, I think, I'm trying to see pattern recognition quickly, quick tactics, you know, training my reflexes um, and my intuition, and you know, applying that to either in a real game when time gets very low. That's a pretty uh, obvious parallel to to a, a quick online game, um, but obviously the pattern recognition and stuff like that can be applied uh, throughout the game. Definitely, definitely. So, do you have a favorite time control, whether it be like a tournament game or even online? Well, uh, I do like classical chess uh, quite a lot still, and you know it does appeal to me. It's not like I'm bored of it. But if I'm picking a favorite time control, it's got to be just just one zero. Um, and that's probably more online. If I'm playing over the board, I don't like 1-0 that much. Um, it's hard to be as quick. It's a lot of piece knocking over, um, stuff like that. So I prefer three minutes each when we're playing in real life and probably one minute uh, if we're playing online. So do you think that some of the, like the hyper bullet or even when you guys do a berserk on them so you'll have like 15 seconds for the entire game, do you ever find that to be too fast or is it just kind of... Well, it depends. Um, it depends. Sometimes if my opponent is just you know, not playing real chess moves and just chucking <laughs> chucking pieces at me because they know I have, you know, 15 seconds for the entire game, which is pretty much nothing, then that can get frustrating um, because even at 15 seconds, you know, I'm not chucking pieces. I'm playing normal good moves. I'm trying my best not to hang things. Um, I'm, ex I'm expecting or predicting certain things from my opponent. So I'm trying to do it as, as pure as I can. So obviously it can get frustrating when my opponent isn't playing the same way. But uh, yeah, it happens sometimes. I hear it all the time in the videos where dirty moves, dirty moves, and you know someone <laughs> yeah. will plant a bishop right next to your queen, and yeah. you're playing a normal opening, and that thing just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, like they, they play a move that, if it was long time control, 
they would resign after making that move because I would just take their bishop or something. But in this time control, I have 15 seconds, so often I'll make my next move um, before even my opponent has moved. So I'll pre-move it, and then yeah, they'll they'll catch me off guard with a, a sneaky move. So people people are learning that you know if you can't beat them properly, you know hey, let's do things dirty. So do you think that bullet is kind of a really useful thing because? I see like you and Eric are, you know, top five on a lot of these sites when, I mean, you're not top five in the world chess players, you guys are obviously extremely talented, but, and you see players, young players like Fahid Rosen, who, you know, Fide Master, but a really, really talented bullet player, yeah. you know, pretty young for a chess player. Yeah, it's definitely a, a young person's game online. I mean, there are, there are old guys and it's pretty respectable for me, you know, when you see a, an older guy who you don't expect to be that good at bullet, you know, really fast with the mouse or really dexterous or something um, but in general it's going to be like young kids uh, even kids like I was saying who aren't that good over the board yet but when you show that talent online it usually does translate to, to over the board success uh, at least that's the recent trend so it is almost like y you play a game against someone or a match then afterwards you, you check the name or who you were playing and you find out the kid's like 11 years old so that's not uncommon nowadays. <laughs> And I have to say, I guess I'm a little bit surprised to say that you really like classical because when I watch the videos in the stream, um, for some reason it sticks out in my mind that like you must not like it, but I guess that's just kind of the false perception with watching that. Well, it's just that that's no fun to watch uh, yeah. on a stream, so so we are catering to what people like, um, but that doesn't go away from what we, I mean, we, we like the, the fast chess a lot, so it's not like we're just uh, you know putting on a show. But at the same time, the most pure form of chess is classical chess. So uh, if I didn't like that, I mean, at the end of the day, that's where I get the GM title. That's where people respect my, my chess. You know, you can't really be successful just from being online. You have to go over the board, win some tournaments, you know, show your actual class uh, with some of the things that, you know, actually go into playing chess full time, memorization, openings, theory, um, beating players better than you, stuff like that. So um, I, I am still a fan of the most classical or pure form of, of chess, which is the, the long the long play. Very, very cool. A um, couple of quick questions that maybe we can play a few games in Shiptown. Sure, yeah. Um, so I guess in a Blitz game, what would be your favorite opening of white? Blitz game? Um, well, as white, I almost always start with a d4. So if I would say my favorite opening in Blitz, it might be uh, the most annoying thing I think of when I play black. So it's probably the London system. It is gotcha. uh, d4, bishop f4, knight f3, and just not committing anything too far off the board, playing so passive, not really passive, but solid, safe, and uh, not making any weaknesses. And sort of just waiting for your opponent to make a mistake while playing very fast. So you get a big time advantage, and you don't have many weaknesses in your position. So it's tough to crack. I hate playing it uh, against it with black, so it's got to be my go-to with white. Okay. Um, you're familiar with the Grandmaster Blitz battles on chess.com? I am, yes. Who do you think's going to win the whole thing? Uh, I think, well, uh, if it goes to online, like uh, Nakamura has, has lost some games in, in you know the US championships that's going on right now, uh, the candidates didn't go too well for him. But when it comes to online, the guy is really a beast. Um, it would be a huge shock to me to see him lose a match. Uh, obviously, Carlson is playing as well, so you know, do you really bet against Carlson? But I think in terms of online chess, uh, no one has any into or uh, insight as to how good he, he's going to be. He could, he could be terrible. Like he could lose to a pre move and you know get really mad or something like that. Like Naka has handled that for a long time, so uh, I feel like Nakamura is the the easy bet. Um, although. Carlson, number one player in the world, is in the field. Uh, I feel like Nakamura has the upper hand in terms of this format, even though Carlson kind of has his number uh, in classical chess. And I've heard people say that's the big question mark just about Carlson. Like, I've heard rumors that he plays on chess.com under like fake names and whatnot, but I feel yeah. there's just no way to know until you know time gets there if they end up playing each other. Yeah, I definitely know that he used to play on, on ICC, and I'm quite confident I've played him myself, even, even beaten him a game or two. Um, so he's, he's been kind of hiding under various <laughs> aliases and stuff. Uh, he had one public account, but in general, I know that he is playing online. Like a guy like him, as I'm describing, like the internet age is really where chess is going. He's not just gonna 
not be a part of it. Like he is playing online somewhere, um, so he will be practiced, but he just has never done it publicly, which is why this uh, this format is so interesting. So I guess while we're talking about him, it seems like he's kind of becoming a celebrity in the chess world. Do you, do you think it's good for the game? Yeah, oh, fantastic. I mean, it, if I'm picturing him versus any other guy in the, the top 10, who do I want to be the ambassador? It's definitely him. I mean, he's going the right direction. He's, he's securing like modeling contracts. Um, you know, he's a young guy, he's a, he's a good looking guy. The, that's the kind of face that personally I want for, for chess. I don't want an old guy who's, uh, you know, just there to be a machine and not be social. I mean, he does the interviews and stuff like that. So I think what, what he's doing, he has the team behind him, marketing him well. He's got a very nice website and stuff like that. So I think he's doing the right things. And he's getting a lot of attention from non-chess sponsors and, uh, you know, doing some sort of marketing promotions for things that aren't chess related. So he's, he's gaining interest from people outside of chess, which I think is fantastic. And I think that the new um, documentary coming out could do a lot of um, a lot of good for the sport if you know it really picks up momentum. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I'm very excited to watch that. Like at the end of the day, I say when Nakamura is online, I, I like to watch it. Like it's like a show for me. So I am still a fan of these guys as well as trying to be one of their colleagues. <laughs> Definitely. And um, I guess to close out, do you have any predictions for the World Championship? Speaking of Carlson. Yeah, speaking of, uh, should be interesting if it uh, stays and it looks like it will in, in New York. Um, Carlson against Karyakin. Um, my prediction is probably going to be the same as a lot of people's. Uh, and it's just that it's a bit obvious. Karyakin qualifying is huge for his career, but I think that he's just outmatched by Carlson at the moment um, because Karyakin's style is, you know, he, he's good at playing even positions and he, he excels, let's say, in, in sturdy defense but that's not necessarily a winning style. And I can't imagine Carlson you know, losing to that, to that style in, in a long match, I would say. So with that, were you surprised when he won the candidates? I was, but at the same time, you have to think about it like that style in a high pressure tournament where nerves are everything. Um, being that guy who makes those consistent results, he doesn't make mistakes very often. Uh, you know, he's got that consistent you know, if he gets a bad position, he can hold it and not lose, whereas other guys might get impatient or curse themselves for getting into that position and then mess it up even more. Um, he doesn't, he didn't make too many mistakes. He didn't drop too many games. Like that's that kind of sturdy style that usually does win these high pressure events. Very cool. Yeah, no, um, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm not very far from New York City, so I would definitely love to go down. I you have to. They said the, um, the first game is supposed to be in Times Square. Yes. It almost seems like what better place in the world, you know? Exactly. It has to start there. So, so like you said, hopefully everything kind of stays as it should. Yeah. No, if it does, I mean, you have to go down there and check it out. It would be, it would be very cool. Well, um, with that, would you like to play a few games online? Sure. Yeah. It would be my pleasure. Let me get it set up. Cool. Do you want to start out with some three minute and maybe play some one minute after? Sure. Yeah, whatever whatever you like. Do you have a preference yourself? Which, um, which one are you better at? I'd say three minutes. I'm probably going to have a little nerves, not going to lie. Um, I don't expect too much out of myself here, but you know, it's all good fun, obviously. Yeah. I try to be quick with the mouse. Sometimes the uh, one minute can be a little advantage there. But. All right, let's see. So do you find yourself playing on lead chess the most? Which, you know, one of the sites obviously, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, would I say that I find myself there the most? Um, yes, but uh, that's been changing a lot recently. Like, uh, there's more stronger players on chess.com, so uh, I am playing a lot more there recently. And, you know, that's where I've, you know, y you feel good about getting your rating to a certain level on chess.com because you're playing against stronger players. Um, whereas lead chess, it's more of like a, sort of a routine practice, um, but you know, you don't tell your mom about your, your high score on VHS. Yeah, they have a pretty unique tournament structure, 
like chess.com has a lot of tournaments too, but it is pretty different from that. Yes. But it's like a region you can think of as an account on chess.com. Exactly. Exactly. So this is the online, I believe. 3 0? That work? Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Does that look okay? Yeah. Okay. Good luck, sir. First mistake, uh, G6. First big mistake. Give away your dark square bishop. Never weaken the dark squares. So I was afraid of that H7 there. That's not common even if the uh, knight was still there. I get a little trapped in these positions, I can't lie. Well, yeah, nobody likes to, you know, not have a lot of space, <laughs> etc. It's going to be hard to block, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you've done this before. <laughs> Yep. Take the white pieces. We get a little comfort zone there. I see you play this as black a lot, and it's pretty dangerous. Yeah. I've tried to copy it in games, but I just can't do the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. Move that fish up around a little bit. the tactic. You already know it's coming. I 
I was actually expecting that a little bit differently, but that worked pretty well. <laughs> Slow down here. Okay. Let's use the whole clock. That's right. This isn't a, a bullet game. This is a blitz game. To a certain extent, you want to keep pace with me in order to not just you know lose on the clock. But by the same token, you, you can't play as fast as me because there's no way you should be able to to see the things as fast as I do. So. You yeah. should take that extra time to to iron mm -hmm. things out. Hang the E four point doesn't help that either. <laughs> well, let's close that up a little bit. So are just end games like this completely routine for you? Uh, yeah, definitely. There's there's nothing really that uh, I'm thinking about. It's all just automatic kind of reflex. <laughs> Which means I have a lot of hope here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna right here. Yeah, it's a pretty good time. Yeah, no, th things like that are definitely like I'm hardly even calculating because I, I know that even not necessarily the best move um, it is going to be enough. Okay, I'm gonna give me a little bit of my own medicine. Try it.
So do you enjoy playing like book positions more or just completely wacky, just like pieces everywhere type of positions? Um, it, it probably depends, but in general I definitely don't like the, the pieces everywhere type of feel. Uh, I'm, a, I'm more controlled, like I like to have things under control, you know, like position I'm familiar with. Uh, I think I do much better at those. So I wouldn't necessarily say book position, but even if it's something that's not book, as long as it's like solid and not too crazy, then, then I'll be a fan. I have to admit, I haven't gotten beat this badly in a long time. <laughs> have you? Who's like one of the strongest players you've played then? Um, the guy that I had mentioned, uh, the National Master, who I ended up playing, never told me who he was, is named Ian Harris, so like 2300-ish. Um, yep. And I've played kind of fooling around matches, like time odds type things, or I've drawn even like three minutes to five minutes, um, yeah. you know, in fun. Sure, sure. But um, it, it's not a regular thing. Yeah, and with these sites, I generally end up playing people around my rating level. So you know, obviously, you're not going to get crushed normally. Yep. But w while you might say you're you're getting crushed, I mean, the things you're blundering are like pawns here and there, you know, like positional concessions. But I mean, you're not you're nowhere close to blundering full pieces or anything like that. Um, and of course, uh, as I say that, though I am locked down pretty hard here. <laughs> see, I guess what I'm like most impressed by is just kind of positional stuff here that I just don't normally see. Yeah, you'll you'll get that a lot more from me um, than let's say the the fancy tactics and stuff like that. Like, I'm partially figuring out where to move and partially just realizing that I have nowhere to move. Yep, I thought the other pawn could move. Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you more than maybe a bullet? Sure. So do you find a big difference here on lead chest with um the like there being pretty much no delay between moves where on chess.com is a little more? Yeah, I, I can say I prefer it like aesthetically or whatever. Like yeah. it definitely feels a bit nicer. Um, but uh, other than that, like it, you get different things on, on each platform. Like one, you might get something that looks better, feels better. The other one just has that raw, you know, better opponents type of stuff, better matchmaking. So I know on chess.com, like I've had a lot of pre moves set, and I'm just hoping to God that they go through without my time elapsing. But here on the <laughs> Like, yeah, I know they're going through. Exactly. No, there's definitely a, a different feel. And this is the B2 trick that I never get right. Which I know if I move that fish out, that one's gone. Well, not right now. I mean, you have your queen on E2, so you uh, have everything under control. And I, I've seen you play the French a lot. You like, you know, Yeah, that's <laughs> one of my faves, definitely.
should have played a queen. <laughs> Actually, I should do that. Yeah. Pretty close to the end there. <laughs> One more of these? Yep. Sounds good. And again, I really appreciate your time for doing this. Switch it up? Sure. Uh, do you want to do it again? Some 
mods now. Have to. I'm trying to be like extra cautious while I'm moving, but I do not have time for it. Exactly. It's, that's usually the case. Yeah. <laughs> One more? Sure. Let's do it. having fun. that's that that's that well um thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it you have given an awesome interview thanks very much that's my pleasure so when do you